Hey, y'all. I have my good friend Maggie Luna here with me on the show. I'm so excited because her story is incredible. Maggie, welcome to the show. Hi, Marcy. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm so excited, Maggie. I already know what a superstar you are, and I just want everybody to hear your story. Because we know each other, I know that you have a history with substance abuse disorder. Can we kind of start there, like when you started with that? Yeah. So I grew up in an alcoholic home, (laughs) and it was very chaotic. I had five half brothers and sisters and there were four of us and so my childhood was not a happy I don't I can't name any happy childhood memories until I found drugs and it was like that was happiness for me and that was when I was 16 years old I was in the ninth grade and once somebody introduced me to marijuana I was like oh my gosh it was an escape you know, I didn't know that that's what it was, but, and so that was my original escape. It started with a marijuana at about 16 and then it just kind of snowballed into heavier drugs. Yeah. So I started using just smoking weed and I was drinking with my friends and like when we would go out to parties and stuff, people would drink and then they'd go home and be fine. I would drink until I threw up and blacked out and so it was but it was an escape like I said you know it just that's what made me forget everything that was happening at home and so from there I started running away from home and using with people on the streets Um, that's where I was introduced to cocaine and then from cocaine I had a really terrible terrible the worst time of my life with crack and that was the worst time of my life. I, I've never in my entire addiction been that low, but I, and I've been low. But from then I went on to meth and that was around, I was 21. So from 21 to 36, it was meth and opiates. And that was just normal. The heavy stuff for sure. Mm-hmm. During that addiction and when you were in the low part of your life, you had some trouble with the legal system. Right. Right. So you had some arrests. Can you talk about that? Yeah. The first time that I ever got arrested, I believe that. Okay. So this was when I was 16. I had just started using, there was a lot of stuff going on at home and I was sexually assaulted by a football player at my school. And when I went to the police about this, they came and knocked on my front door. And this is dead serious. I'm not even lying. Since you smoked a marijuana joint with this man, we don't know if you gave consent or not. So we're not going to follow through with charges. That was the first encounter that I ever had with law enforcement where I believed that they were there to help me. And they made me feel like my experience was not real. And so, and I just started using, so I started going deeper into using and I quit school. And when I quit school, I was kind of lost. I wanted to get my GED, but I didn't know what to do. And I had remembered my English teacher talking about GED. So I went back on campus just to ask him, like, where do I go? What do I do? Well, the football player had seen me on campus somehow. I don't know what happened. I really don't. I do know that I was arrested on campus for criminal trespassing in front of all of the kids who were still in school, they all knew that I quit school. And so it was a really humiliating experience at 16 years old. And then I had to go spend the night in um, Montgomery County Juvenile Center. And that was terrifying. It was so like, I didn't know anything. I was just locked in this cold cell. There was no windows. And I was just terrified. And that was my first encounter. And like, now looking back, I can see that that was like, a door that opened for me where I was like, this is just where I belong. And that's where the cycle just started. And it went on for 20 years. Well, I know for sure you were at Plain State Jail at one point in TDCJ. How old were you when that happened? I actually went to Plain State twice. So my first incarceration was just the criminal trespassing. And then um, I got arrested a couple of times for theft, shoplifting, and it was all due to my addiction. I was just trying to feed my habit. And 2000, 
11 was my first time to go to TDCJ. It was my first felony. And this is the where I also believed that if I did the right thing, the police were going to do the right thing. I was told that if I came in and answered some questions, they would make sure that I did not deliver. I was pregnant. And so they would make sure I didn't deliver my baby in prison. Well, I didn't, but I did seal my own indictment with a confession, basically, because I thought that we were cooperating. But once I got my first felony in 2011 and I got arrested and I figured it's my first felony. The girl that I got arrested with, same charge. We got the same charge. We were doing the same thing together. She got a 1244A and got out in 90 days. So I had no idea what a 1244A was, but she told me just ask for a 1244A. So I was all like, okay, well, I'm going to go home. You know, I had a brand new baby at home and I thought that this was going to be just like a few days. Well, the charge carried up to 20 and today this sounds stupid, but my defense officer, or I mean, defense attorney came in and was like, so they're going to give you 20. And I was like, what? Like, and seriously, when they said that, it was like, I, I don't know what happened. I just know the tears just started falling down my face. Like 20 years, I have a baby at home. It, it was just baffling. And then she's like, okay, well, hang on. And she went back out and then she came back and was like, well, if you sign right now, it'll be two. And so I, I felt like it was a blessing, right? I got two, you know? But then I still forgotten this, that other girl just left with 90 days, you know? And I asked her, I said, what about a 1244A? And she goes, what makes you think that you're even eligible for that? It's like, I don't know. I don't know what it is, <laughs> you know? But she was like, no, we'll just sign this. You'll go on, you'll make parole and you'll be fine. So that was in 2011. I got pulled to Plain State and oh my God, I was so naive, so scared. I mean, it, it was, it was horrifying. You describe that institution a little bit for us. Yeah. So, okay. So when I first, I knew I was going to pull chain. I didn't know anything about Plain State. I didn't know. I just knew I was headed to prison. And so when we're sitting in that holding cell before we go, I'm hearing these stories, but I can't wait till we get there. It's going to be, uh, you know, because people were like, everything's better over there. And I was like, okay, it's going to be fine. Well, then we get off the bus and you have to change out from your county clothes to your whites and we walk into this giant barn and there's like three cages of women and we're in a front cage while they're sitting there watching us come in and we all have to circle around this giant trash can like a dumpster barrel sized trash can not dumpster I mean you know big and they're like okay and you have to start stripping and you have to take off whatever they tell you at the, at the time they tell you, you better not take off something else because then you're going to get humiliated. Like, are you dumb? I didn't say that yet, you know? <laughs> oh my God. And th these were two very large women that were just humil loved to humiliate us. They were telling us, throw your clothes in here, do this, do that, you know, and it's just very overwhelming. And uh, I wear glasses. And so you have to go get that checked in. But they don't tell you what's happening. They just say, give me your glasses. And I'm like, am I going to get them back? Because I'm blind without them. And she was like, girl, go on, go over there. <laughs> I don't know what the hell is happening. Like, you're taking my glasses from me, you know? And it's just like, it's like a mill, you know? They're just like pushing you through. And then they send us over to shower. I still don't have my glasses. And I'm this whole time I'm like panicking because I'm blind and I'm having to like hear where they're calling and all that. And then they call me stupid because I can't, I don't know who's talking. Girl, are you stupid? You don't hear me calling you? I don't know who you're talking to. You're saying girl and we're all girls, you know? And so, uh, God, it was so humiliating. And then they send you in there to shower for, uh, wash your three spot, three hot spots, you know? I'll never forget that woman saying that. I was like, what? Three hot spots. Oh, my God. Anyway, so whenever they give me my glasses back, I had to, like, they gave me this piece of paper, and they were like, make sure you carry that with you everywhere you go. Don't lose that. So then we go into this little cage with all these other people, and, and I think, I don't remember how long it was, like 24 hours before we actually got food. They brought us in a sandwich while we were in this cage, and literally people are on top of each other. 
like this is America. <laughs> I had never heard anyone I, call it um like that it felt like it was going through a meal, but I went through plain state as well. And that's exactly what the feel of it, that description was very accurate. So yeah, it's it's horrifying. It's horrifying. And you were doing this coming down off of opiates and methamphetamines and and you had a baby at home. So all of these things, it's like major sensory overload, I'm sure. Yeah. And you, you have to shut that part off when you, you're thinking about your kids and all of that. Like I had to shut that part off and detoxing in Harris County jail was the worst. So I don't think I really detoxed until like 30 days. That's when my mind started coming back and all that so yeah i was still like in a daze and being shipped through to bend over and i'm i'm a bigger girl and so when they're like lift your stomach and this woman looks at me and says not that stomach your other one and i'm like what are you talking about and there's a barn full of women laughing you know that is, it was not necessary and but that's not the only time that I was publicly humiliated at TDCJ, you know. We kind of laugh about that a little bit. And for sure, while we were incarcerated, we would laugh about that kind of stuff happening. And I feel like that's a trauma response because we were humiliated and degraded. And yes, it was awful. And I'm sorry that you had to go through that. I really am. I get to ask you very specific questions because I know so much about you already. Uh, Maggie is really one of my good friends, y'all. One of the times that you were incarcerated there in Dayton, Texas, there was a hurricane. Can you tell yes. us about that? That was my last visit. Yeah, my last visit in 20, I was arrested in 2016 and I was there for 2017, Hurricane Harvey. I seriously, oh my God, that's the worst time of my life I so we found out that there was a storm coming and you know at Plain State there's always like tornadoes and stuff so we were just like whatever you know it'll hit the field or well then the rain just started coming and then they shut off the tv so we couldn't know what was going on out there and then the warden came in and she had like this rain jacket on rain boots and she's looking all around they're talking to each other but they weren't talking to us and then before she walked out, she was like, okay, if the roof blows off, you're going to have to grab your mats and run to the bathroom because the bathroom's in the middle of the dorm. And whoever gets to the furthest to the wall is probably going to be the one that's going to make it, you know? Like, And I remember looking around like, I do not want to be looking at these women when I die. I had a possession charge, you know? And you are telling me I may potentially die with these women? What in the hell? And so... Um, and we didn't know. We didn't know what the what was going on. And the way that everybody was like rushing around, we thought, okay, something serious is happening, but we don't know. And so as the rain kept going, um, our lights went out. And, you know, in Plain State, there's two big fans in the dorms. And it's already hot. These fans just kind of move the air. They don't help. And so the lights went out. And so the air was very stagnant. And then the fans stopped. And when the fans stopped, my bunkie across from me, she goes, this is some fucking total recall shit. And I've never seen the movie and I haven't seen it to this day, but I'll never forget what she said. Because <laughs> it's like, she's like, have you ever seen it? And I was like, no. And she goes, this is when everybody dies. And I was like, oh my God, what are you talking about? And then like the, the air stopped moving. It was so hot. It was already hot outside. But then it was like humid and disgusting and I can remember think looking at this girl and she was panicking and she was like what's gonna happen? she kept getting down going to the front and knocking on the door and like oh my god we're gonna die in here we can't get out the doors are locked you know what the fuck are we gonna do like it was she was panicking and then she was making me angry because I was like trying to calm myself down and so I was like sit down please just chill out and I remember thinking I wish she would just stop breathing because she's sucking up all the air you know, and it's a terrible thought, but it was like, that's, I felt like I had to fight for air. And then the toilet stopped working. It doesn't mean that the women stopped using the restroom. They just stopped being able to flush it. It was toxic, toxic fumes, just like, and I'm laying on my bunk. There was one row of bunks and then the restroom. So I'm just one row between the restrooms and, oh God. And 
even the officers weren't coming in and doing count because it stunk so bad. There was no air in there. And I was like, not even they want to come in here. They don't care about us. I mean, and when they, we didn't get a, a sandwich or anything, a Johnny, nothing. And I want to say it was like 36 hours. I know it was over 24. And none of us had eaten. Everybody's commissary was like gone because we hadn't made store. And so it was just a terrible. And I remember I had one <laughs> package of Maria cookies. And I was sitting on my bed with my Bible. And I was like, if this roof blows off, I'm going to be sitting here with cookies and a Bible. <laughs> I'm going to die with these cookies. That's my life. <laughs> That's so insane. That feeling of helplessness in there. I just can't imagine. It's crazy. In the middle of your life, right? In the middle of the addiction and in and out of jails and, and prison, you had some babies. Yeah. You have a story behind that. And so do you mind and just whatever you're comfortable with sharing, we would love to hear it. Okay. Yeah. So through, during my addiction, I was blessed with three beautiful human beings, but I was deep in my addiction and there was a lot of chaos. We moved around a lot and um, I couldn't stop using. And so in 2015, my parental rights were completely terminated. And in the state of Texas, what that means is that you are done. Like, and so when I when I walked into court that day, I firmly believed that my kids were coming home with me that day. And because I had been doing everything that I possibly could, there were some things that I just couldn't do. I didn't have a car. I was an addict trying to stay sober by myself. And I didn't have the skills that I needed. And so, um, but I, I thought that I was doing the best I could. Anyway, so I thought that I was going to go home with my kids that day. I walked in with this trifold board that had each one of my kids from birth to the last day I saw them because I was an involved mother. I had pictures of us together and I showed this to the judge and the judge never even looked at me. He looked at his paper and goes, terminate. And my attorney was like, judge, are you saying that what everything that she's done was for nothing? And he was like, well, you know, this history of going in and out of prison and jail, you know, she's just not heroin addicts don't get clean they just don't so we're gonna terminate closed adoption and I didn't even know what closed adoption meant but I remember walking out of there like my soul had been ripped out like you just told me and I was so angry like you are a man and you are telling me I'm no longer a mother what world am I in that this is okay you know this man that knows nothing about me just told me walk away we'll take them from here so I spiraled out of control really quickly. I was like a uh, danger to society. I was danger to myself. I was a danger to others because I no longer cared. I had nothing left, nothing, you know, and I was already deep in my addiction. I had already been living this life that was, I was so ashamed of. And so it just didn't matter anymore. And uh, so when I lost parental rights, they terminated my rights. My kids were split up. My oldest daughter was adopted by my mother. She couldn't take all three. And um, my youngest daughter was adopted by the family that had her, um, that was foster in her, her foster family. And this woman told me, you have to have a goodbye visit with your kids. Once the judge terminates, he sets up a meeting for you to tell your children goodbye. Like that just is, <laughs> yeah. I just cannot believe that this is actually a thing. And so when I went to my goodbye visit, I had set up a picture frame for each one of my kids. And each one of them had a picture of me with them in the middle and all of my information on the back. So, the, and I was just like, hopefully they'll keep this and one day they'll find me. And so my youngest daughter's adopted family said, oh, we'll, we'll stay connected. Even if I just send you letters or whatever, you know, you'll be able to keep up with her. Never heard from her again. Once the adoption was final, they changed her name. They moved away and I haven't seen her since 2015. There was really no pathway for me to even fight that. You know, Texas takes your rights and it's done. My oldest daughter was adopted and my mom could have chosen to keep her from me because it was a closed adoption. But the way the law is, is if the adopted parents choose, they can still choose to have interaction with me. My youngest, they chose not to. And my oldest, my mom 
chose to bring her to see me. And when my daughter started coming to see me in prison, that was when I started to get some new found hope that maybe one day my kids will find me. And when I got out, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew that my son was still in foster care and that he was being bounced from home to home to home. I didn't know what was going on. I was just hearing bits and pieces because my mom was still in contact because they get sibling visits. And um, anyway, so I started reaching out to CPS in 2018, 2018. And uh, I was like, look, y'all aren't doing anything with him. Is there any way we can work something out? You know, like I'm trying to get clean now. And they were like, no, ma'am, your rights have been terminated. And they even told me, ma'am, I don't know if you remember, but your rights were terminated. No, I don't remember the worst day of my life. I I mean, like, and does it make you feel better to ask me that every time I call you, you know, because I'm not going to stop. So anyway, um, last session, there, there happened to be a bill that Texas Public Policy Foundation was working on. Texas Center for Justice and Equity was working on it. And I showed up and just told my story. And this bill provided a pathway for children who are still in the system two years after removal, if the mother or father or family member has stabilized, then now the court can go back and look to see if we can reunite them. So at this time, Maggie, you're out of prison. You've stopped using. You're mm -hmm. at the Capitol now. Yeah. That's how drastic of a turn of events oh, yeah. taken. So yeah, so I got out of prison and I started getting clean. And that's when I started reaching out to CPS. Like, I'm getting clean. I'm trying to do this because I want my kids to find me in a better position. You know, even if they read about me one day, I want them to read that I did not just walk away. And um, I wasn't in a spot at that time where I could actually provide for anybody, but I wanted them to know that I was willing to do whatever because they weren't doing anything with it. Through my journey of trying to find a job, being rejected at every turn, I started meeting people who were using their stories and making change. And then I started learning about the Capitol and laws. And the way that everything happened was because I allowed it to happen because I didn't know my right. And there is a way, you know, we just have to make it. We have to make a way. And so um, I was at the Capitol advocating, and that's when I found out about the bill. And I didn't even, in 2019, I was up there strictly to talk about TDCJ prison conditions. The way they treated us was hor horrifying. 2021, when I found out about this bill, I was like, well, maybe there's a chance, you know? And so um, I testified every piece of the way. And uh, we got it passed, the family reunification law. How did it feel in front of House representatives, in front of senators? How did it feel standing there with the microphone telling your story? It's crazy because with TDCJ and I'm telling my story and I'm like, you know, this is what I had to endure because of you. I'm better at that. But when I had to go up there and like tell them I messed up, that's why I don't have my children. I was an addict. That's why I could not provide for them. But I'm telling you today that I'm clean and I've been clean for this long. And, you know, that was more me being more vulnerable than I've really been in the past. So I broke down every t like I was if you watch the testimony, I I'm like hyperventilating, and so you know, because it's just so emotional to have to say that in front of people who are basically the same people who took them from me you know I sat in front of a man and he told me my rights were terminated and then I had to come back in front of all of these people and beg them to give me another chance I think it can be a little intimidating in front of that particular group of people because they have not seen anything like what what I've seen in the prison system, what you've seen in the prison system, what you've seen on the streets, your mm -hmm. family growing up, they haven't. And so I can imagine that it was so that the law gets passed. The testimony helps the representatives, the senators, they voted, the, it went on it, the governor's desk. In the House, when it, when it went through the House and I testified, Representative Valerie Swanson came out and we were talking in the rotunda and she was just like, I want to thank you for your testimony. She's like, this just, it blows my mind. Like, why won't they give you a chance? 
And I'm like, I don't know. I've been reaching out since 2018. It's now 2021. And, and they're still slamming the door in my face. And she was like, this is, this has to change. And so her knowing that there are people out there that have, that do change and seeing me face to face, you know, that helped push it, you know? And then the Senate, one of the senators came out afterwards and he, he said, I cannot believe that they won't give you any access and you don't even know where your baby is. And I was like, no, I mean, and look, I'm up here every day fighting for other people, right? you know but my kid doesn't even know that I'm looking for him the bill got passed and after once it's I filed the petition for my son to come home or I thought I did <laughs> the paperwork is still it's still brand new so the paperwork is kind of hard to deal with and so we're trying to make that easier and which is good that I am going through this so it can be easier for other parents behind me you know but um once I was able to start that connection back with my son, I went to those representatives and I thanked them for voting and showed them what policy does, you know, it changes people's lives and it could do that for the bad or for the good. Your son had not been adopted and that's what gave you the opportunity to then, because your other children had been adopted. Fortunately, you were able to have contact with your oldest daughter because she was adopted within the family. But so where is your son now? He's behind me sleeping. <laughs> so, you're a full-time mom. Yes. I went from one day, them telling me you are done. We've got your kids now. You can walk away to one day them telling me, here you go. And at, that was seven years in between that. So seven years I had been doing work on myself and I thought that I was at a place where everything was going to be. And of course, nothing is perfect, right? Um, I had this reunification story in my mind that everything was going to be perfect and everything's fine. But I didn't realize or think it through that he went through seven years of trauma, seven years of being bounced from home to home. Some homes he was only in for 24 hours, if that. He was hospitalized several times. He was beat up by his foster brothers. And so now he's 13 and I'm a full-time mother and it's an experience. Any parent of a 13-year-old child, Maggie, could say it's an experience. Because I know you on a very personal note, I want to tell you right now that you are doing a tremendous job of taking things day by day, taking things as they come. And it's all of those little memories that are the smallest of little memories that are mm -hmm. making it for you guys. And I'm just so happy and excited that y'all are together. <laughs> he sees his oldest sister, but your middle baby, we're, we just have hopes that when she gets of age, because she is mm -hmm. adopted, we just hope that she will find you all. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a possibility. Kids do that all the time. Yes. And I want her to know that we talk about her all the time. They refuse to call her her changed adopted name. And my son, when he first started, we first started integrating again, he had memories of her, but he did, he couldn't, he was like, there was another girl. And I'm like, that was your sister. He was like, no, that's my sister. Uh, no, I, I see my sister, but I had to convince him like, no, that's your sister. Y'all were 11 months apart. They were like twins. I have pictures of them in the same stroller, you know, they slept together. I mean, and so he'll, he's starting to have more memories now. And uh, we talk about her all the time. I love that, Maggie. That's an inspiration for a lot of mothers that have lost custody of their kids in the state of Texas. I think that a lot of people don't know that that bill passed, that there mm -hmm. is a pathway for them to be able to petition and present their case in front of a judge and say, look, I, I'm U8, I'm clean, I'm here, I have a home, I'm working. And I think that that can give a lot of people hope and give them motivation to move forward. Yes. And one thing that I want everybody to know that if you're in this limbo period where your children have been removed, they aren't adopted, but you're not at the two years yet, make sure you are documenting every little success. You get a... Uh, certification for food handling keep that you get promoted document that and you when you do 
file your petition, you have every single thing noted that you have accomplished since they have removed your children. And so you have more to fight with. Can we talk about your current employment and what you do? We know that you're advocating at the Capitol. Can you, can we talk about that? Yeah. So I got the biggest blessing in all of my life and I was able to, I got the fellowship, a fellowship to do policy. And peer policy is what someone influences policy from a peer posi- peer um, position, right? So like, I don't, I didn't go to school for policy. I lived it. My experience is my expertise. And so um, when I moved here in 2020, my mentor was starting this statewide leadership council and they told me this is going to be your project. And we had our first meeting in 2020. It was a bunch of leaders from all across Texas. And these people were all doing amazing things in their own communities. The vision was to invest in these leaders and have them build more leaders in their communities. So when we do go advocate at the ledge, um, like I live in Austin. So when I go talk to a representative that that is representing Dallas, I can say that we have constituents in your district who have been to prison and who are doing this. They're leading in your community. And so that's the vision. It started out in 2020. We just had 14 members. Now we're at over 300. And the most important piece about Statewide Leadership Council is being able to connect with people who have been there in the beginning, you know, because when I first started policy, I felt like an imposter because I never even graduated high school. I got my GED after I dropped out. I was in these spaces with people who had all of these degrees and letters behind their names. And so it was very intimidating for me. So with the Statewide Leadership Council, it's important to me that we meet people where they're at and give them the tools that they need to be successful at the ledge. So we're not being intimidated and pushed away because that's what they want. They want us to say, it's too difficult. I'm not going to do this. And it's easy for us to just, since we've been beat down so much, either in the streets or inside of prison, to just say, I've already been through enough. I don't want to continue being intimidated by these people. I'm just going to go live my life. And so Statewide Leadership Council is just, we do trainings, we do meetings, and we work on policy, policy that we've all lived. And so this session, we had three pieces of legislation that have made it really far for a new organization. Like we're new, you know, there are people at the ledge, like gun owners of America, They've been going for years. They have big, huge crowds whenever there's a gun bill. So wouldn't that be amazing if when there's a formerly incarcerated movement at the Capitol because there's a bill that's affecting our people, that's where we're, we're going to be one day, you know? I'm a member also, proud member, and it is really an honor to be a part of that with you. So if you're in Texas and your system impacted, please please think about joining that movement. If you're not in Texas, you can support that movement still. And we would appreciate that. And I'll make sure and put SLC's social media handles and everything across here. Was there anything that we didn't talk about that you maybe wanted to share or had in mind to talk about when you knew we were going to meet up? No, I just want to tell you how grateful I am for you, Marcy. I mean, you help in so many ways. Our voices need to be heard. And like, I don't know all of the avenues like you do. And the more people that we bring into this table, you know, the more change we can make. And I think all of the people who've been inside of prison have a story to tell. Most definitely. Thank you, Maggie, so much. Let's go to the sky.